So the question, the question posed in panel two is, okay, slavery in America, does it matter in 2019? Um, so each panelist is going to have just about five minutes just to um, give his and her reflection on the question posed. And then from there, we will have uh, questions between the panelists. So starting first, I'd like to say, uh, can you guys hear me well? Uh, starting first, I'd like to say um, the reason why slavery and its impact that it's had on America matters today is due to the fact of the perceptions and the last, the last long negative impact that it has left on minorities. Specifically, it's more than just African Americans, but just minorities overall due to the fact that uh, different <coughs> shades of brown and, and, and black have di divided America and minorities as a whole overall, and it's, it's become uh, blacks, uh, dark, darker hue individuals uh, against the lighter hue ones, and overall it's just, it's a deep rooted seed that has sprouted and has left many uh, trails and, and, and stems that are continuing to grow with thorns on them. That's all I have for my five minutes. Okay, uh, Dr. Waller, please. Uh, thank you, and thank you for allowing me to be a part of this conversation. Um, the reason that this is so important, I think it helps ex explain what we are experiencing and what we see and our perceptions. <coughs> I like the, the movie Black Panther, and um, so you all remember Black Panther. And the difference, I think they do a really good job in Black Panther because they the difference between Killmonger and T'Challa is white oppression, racism, the history of slavery. When you first meet Killmonger, you want to be mad at him, you want to hate him, you want to uh, view him as an enemy, view him as a problem, see his activity and action and attitude all as individual pathology. And then you step back and realize the reason he is the way he is is because of what he was introduced to. Um, and the difference, I started reading the uh, opening, well, well, the paragraph that dis defines this moment and talks about the, the 20 slaves that first came here and now. The reality of internalized oppression and how some African Americans see themselves and how some people see us is as a result of the systemic and intentional slavery, institutionalization, colonization of our people. And now um, we are uh, seeking to turn that around uh, and address it, not only for the liberation of black people, but for the liberation of all people. Because if you are a white person that still believes the myth about who we are, then you are as, in, as much in prison as we are. Uh, and so I think it's important to have the conversation because without the conversation, we don't really understand what we're looking at. All right, Dr. John. Okay, um, so slavery matters in the 21st century because we pretty much still live in a very segregated America. Um, while we don't have segregation in the legal sense, we have what we call de facto segregation. So we have segregation not happening that's enforced by the law, but we have it happening um, by fact, right? It's happening anyway. Um, this kind of de facto segregation is caused by institutional and individual levels of discrimination. So things like racism, racial profiling, discrimination built into the housing market, redlining, racial steering. One of the biggest forms of um, segregation we see today is residential segregation. We live separately. Um, in terms of residential segregation, we know that a disproportionate number of African Americans live in communities that have high rates of poverty, high rates of unemployment, high rates of crime. They live in communities where there's a lack of access to supermarkets. Um, there's a prevalence of liquor stores on every corner. There's a prevalence of um, tobacco stores on every corner. 
Um, and what this does, it perpetuates a culture of poverty, a cycle of poverty. We know that education is the key um, to get out of poverty. However, as long as African-American youth continue to attend schools that are underfunded, they continue to attend schools that lack basic resources like technology, books, um, stationery, um, they will continue to be disadvantaged. They will continue to be disenfranchised. And as long as the, the playing field isn't even, African, -American, uh, African Americans are going to continuously <coughs> lag behind their white counterparts academically, economically, even in terms of their health outcomes. And um, unless we address these inequalities, slavery is going to continue to matter well into the 21st century and beyond. Uh, Jackson? Thomas, sorry. Oops, sorry. Thank you, Dr. Garrison. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, again, I feel privileged to be here with the panelists. They've all spoken very well and uh, accurately in my humble estimation. Um, uh, so therefore, I don't have to get into some of the other particulars that some of them have already gotten into. Um, but as a psychologist, our uh, emphasis, among other things, is to try to understand why behind human behavior. And before I get into that, um, I'd like to just, to some extent, flip the script in terms of the, the, the thesis statement or the question, I should say, whether or how is slavery still significant in America today? My response is, how the heck is it not still significant? That's the easier question to answer because you can find pretty much that there's almost no element of American culture that slavery, at least indirectly, has not had an impact. Um, as you know, my panelists have already spoken to it very eloquently, so I won't reiterate that unless we get into more detail. Um, but as I do in, in one of my courses, uh, I delineate historically, going back to uh, ancient Kemet or Egypt when the Egyptians were black, the ones that did the pyramids and stuff, all right, and how they influenced science, uh, the sciences, the empirical method, um, and culture, uh, humanity as we know it, then it got taken over. And then came along capitalism through Europe. And the Europeans had to justify how to get a whole bunch of people to make a whole lot of goods and make money for the wealthy for free, what well, they couldn't do to their fellow Christians, because that was unchristianly or non-Christian-like. So they had to come up with rationalizations to get a whole group of people, pay them nothing, treat them inhumanely. And that's where the whole metaphor and the, and the stereotypes of viewing Africans as less than human come from. And we see that today throughout. Um, I won't go into detail just yet. I have elsewhere in previous panels. But there are psychological studies that show that police officers and college students, white college students in particular, police officers in general, not just white police officers, let me be clear. It's a professional issue, all right? They tend to treat black bodies as less than human. Uh, Journal of Personality Social Psychology 2014 did a very eloquent, extensive study, multiple experimental studies and correlational studies that have shown that uh, white people in general, and this is coming from slavery, by the way, and, in, in, and I'll get back to that in a second, but in my black experience class, I show a documentary called Ethnic Notion. If you have Canopy, if you're a Kutztown student, you have access to it, all right? And Ethnic Notions does a very good job of tracing the history of stereotypes of the mammy, of the pickaninny. The pickaninny was a, an African-American child who was stereotypically uh, characterized as less than human and made to look ape-like, and therefore the justification was for whites to, and to allow animals to kill them, alligators and other animals to kill them in their cartoons, and therefore made it easier for actual people, in most cases white people, to then treat little black and brown children inhumanely. And then it ex extends to adults, and uh, literally um, the whole issue of lynching has come up recently, I won't get into that just yet, but the use of that metaphor and that realistic aspect of history, which is still contemporary, by the way, there's still some of that going on a little bit every now and then today, um, is a direct uh, a descendant, if you will, of the inhumane treatment and view of people of color in general, but African Americans and other black uh, people in the diaspora specifically. So whether, as Dr. John spoke to, whether it's education, whether it's politics, whether it's economics, uh, as uh, Dr. Waller uh, alluded to, the internalized oppression, that's what also happens, is that through slavery, 
African Americans or enslaved Africans were taught to internalize the racist oppression that was placed upon them. So even within black communities, we have dark skin, light skin feuds, uh, which goes to you know good slaves, bad slaves, house slaves, field slaves, and of the der derivations of that. And even within the oppressed communities, we have internalized that. And not just in the United States, by the way. Across the entire world where white Europeans have had significant prolonged contact with people of color. In Haiti, in the Dominican Republic, in Brazil, many African countries, most, quite honestly, even in the Philippines, basically where there have been brown people and white folks have come later and through a variety of reasons taken over, internalized oppression has set in, usually after being physically, psychologically, culturally abused and terrorized. And I did use the term terrorizing intentionally because that is the most significant terrorism that's going on today, all right? All of that stems from slavery. It can be easily traced if you take the time and have the guts to look at it. That's all I'll say for now. Okay. Um, let me start with, with, I tell my students that when they are looking at, 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 when I'm teaching criminal justice history, and I tell my students that they need to realize, one, the criminal justice system just didn't beam down from the sky. There's a historical context to it. And there's also a political context to it. So you have to look at all the different sources of news to look at things. So with that as a background, let me do my, uh, but to the contrary, argument. And so let me say, all right, all right, I'll grant you slavery. I'll grant you it was horrible. I'll grant you that even racism was undergirding slavery, which makes it different than other types of history and world history. Okay, I'll grant you all that. I'll grant you Reconstruction. I'll grant you Jim Crow. <coughs> it's 2019. Jim Crow was over 1968. Now you can go and buy any house you can afford. You can go to any school you can afford and have the grades to get into. Rich black people are doing fine. So would you mind telling me why we're having this conversation? I'll start with uh, Dr. Wallace. Mm. Why are we having this conversation? It's been 50 something. The, yeah. minute, the minute Jim Crow was over, 40 years later, you produce a president. Can you please tell me why we're having this conversation? Yeah, we're, we're having this conversation because the deck is still stacked against us, even though we figured out how to play the game. The reality is, I, I started thinking about what I was listening to. My, I am 55 years old. I grew up uh, in Shaker Heights, Ohio. I am, grew up well seated in the middle class. My history is not out of a ghetto. I don't know that history. Uh, I have three degrees. All of my siblings have degrees. My father had degrees. I get that argument, but there, there's a reason that that happened and is connected to our faith that is connected to a strong community uh, rooted in faith. But that does not, our existence does not uh, suggest that the problem is gone. Uh, the reality is we still deal with a very ingrained system of colonization. Let me give as an example, I pastor the Enon Tabernacle Baptist Church. Um, uh, it's a large church. I started to see white people um, come into church. And so I said, I'd like all non-African Americans to come meet me because I think that when you are the majority, you need to ask how the minority is doing in your midst. I asked all non-African Americans to come meet me. I thought that the 50 white people who are in the congregation of 10,000 were going to come and talk to me. I ended up in a room of 400 people who look like me. The reason that I end up in a room with 400 people who look like me is because what they said to me is, Pastor, you said all non-African Americans. I'm Haitian. I'm not African American. And then another person said, uh, a brother that I'd been playing basketball with, he spoke fluent Spanish and then said, I, Papi, I bet you didn't know. The reality is African American is one way of being black. There's not every black person is African American. 
there's Haitians, we are Caribbean, we are African, we are African American. But even those distinctions come about as a result of colonization um, and the internal mindset that we have. Naeem Akbar talks about the psychological chains of slavery. Even when you get rid of the policy that caused the problem, you stirred the water and the water is still stirring even though the spoon is out. And so we have to recognize that even if you get rid of a thing, uh, the effects are still here. And even if we figure out how to play the game, uh, there comes a point when we shouldn't have to play it. Uh, and so that's why we still have to acknowledge that reality of colonization, internalized oppression, uh, and the effects are still there. And the, the presence of success does not deny the reality of the, the systemic problems. Okay, so I think it's interesting you mentioned the game, right? And so you can parallel the effects of slavery 400 years later to a game, right? A board game. So let's say we're all gonna play, I don't know, Monopoly, right? And we're all expected to win Monopoly. However, when we start the game of Monopoly, we're all given different levels of resources in which we all have to compete, right? So as a person of color, your level of resources are way lower compared to your white counterparts. So before you even begin the game, right, the playing field is not even. Yet still, we are expected to have the same outcome. And so the reason why slavery continues to matter today is very structural, right? We have discrimination built into our institutions. When African Americans cannot find jobs because of what their name look like or sound like, right, when they're not even getting an interview because they're being profiled based on their resumes, that's an issue, right? When African Americans cannot live where they want to live because they're being denied home loans at a higher rate, even with equal levels of credit, even with equal levels of income, that's an issue, right? When African Americans are being denied healthcare because there's discrimination built in the healthcare system, right, that's also an issue. And so from an economic, political, social, cultural perspective, if these um, discriminations are built into the structures of our society, we will never be able to compete equally because the playing field simply is not equal. And we're, we're always gonna be disempowered, we're also always gonna be disadvantaged in playing this game, which we're all expected to finish you know, at the same pace when we have varying levels of resources. Mr. Hainsworth? Slavery, it's lasting impact. Speaking from my perspective, the best I can do is just the 20 years that I've been here throughout the school system and public schools. And I'll say that when you look at, when studies show that the the dynamic of the classroom is not geared towards students of color, it is looked at in a Eurocentric aspect, which means that we aren't, the students of color, minorities learn different than Europeans, right? So with that said, they say that individual, individual, individualistic philosophies and ideals work better for them, for, Af for Europeans, which means that they are better in competitive environments with, the no communi with no communal relationships and interactions with others. African Americans and minorities and other minorities work better when they work together with one another. And along with just the idea of not catering towards the, per, not catering towards the needs of African Americans, we will always be oppressed in the classrooms. And if education is key, then it's best to make sure that our, that our people are getting the education that helps them most. And throughout history and even in when I just think back to high school, there was there was always the debate of the light skin versus dark skin debate. And the importance of that is, it's not the fact that this debate just came out of nowhere, this was deeply rooted back to slavery. So with that said, it's just, there are examples everywhere sh being shown time and time again that the long lasting effects from slavery are still present. Okay, um, let me first again, uh, Dr. Garrison's set up statement, it, as soon as you said it, it reminded me back in the 90s, at least those of us uh, who are old enough to remember the 90s, mm -hmm. 
Barbara Walters interviewed, da well, actually, Damon Wayans was talking about him being interviewed by Barbara Walters, the famous uh, uh, female journalist and so on. Um, and he was in a stand-up com uh, comedy act, and he said, yeah, Barbara Walters interviewed me, and she says, you know, Mr. Wayans, Damon, now that you've made all these millions of dollars and have all this money, is there still racism? So that's kind of what your statement reminded me of. And as the panelists, uh, my colleagues here, have, you know, I think eloquently demonstrated in different <laughs> contexts, you're damn right there still is, okay? Just because two or three or four individuals, metaphorically, have made it at least financially or have made some sort of success climbing up the ladder, in no way should imply that the group as a whole is just as successful as other groups that have been more historically successful, all right? Um, now, metaphorically, um, the imbalance still is there, it's structural. Racism is structural, that's where it does its biggest damage, where the individual does not have to intentionally say something that is conceived or perceived to be racist or do something. The system is set up that for those who look like those who control the institutions in the mainstream, they typically have the advantages, even if they don't ask for them. In fact, uh, it's been said uh, that privilege, particularly white privilege, but privilege in general is not necessarily, certainly not all the time, what you get that you didn't ask for or didn't earn. It's more importantly what you don't have to go through that other people who aren't privileged do have to go through. Okay? And that's how it affects not only African Americans, but women in terms of gender and sexism, uh, non-heterosexuals in terms of sexual orientation, uh, and so on and so forth. All right? Um, now, what I also show in some of my classes is a documentary from CNN called, it's all from Anderson Cooper 360. And it talks about and does an actual study uh, that came from the 1930s. Kenneth and Mamie Clark, who are black developmental psychologists, did what's called the famous doll study, where they had black dolls or brown dolls and white dolls and primarily black children and occasionally some white children. Uh, and this study lasted four decades, and the results were always the same. This study was replicated in 2010 and has been rec replicated more recently since then, and the results have still been the same. And what it shows is that, to a certain extent, it's understandable that, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight-year-old kids will identify more with the doll, or at least are supposed to identify more with the doll that looks like them, because that's what they're more familiar with. So it makes sense that white kids would say, the white doll is better, the white doll looks pretty, I want to be like the white doll, people like the white doll better. It would then developmentally be expected that the black kids would say, well, the brown doll, the black doll looks better, I like to be like that one, and da da da. But what they found, and what has been uh, the finding still today is, there is a, a, a very significant difference in that black children tend to still prefer the white doll over the black doll, uh, or the brown doll, all right? And the result of the studies, and in particular this AC360 documentary that I show in class, uh, demonstrates that, as Dr. Margaret Bill Spencer, a very uh, noted uh, developmental psychologist who, com who did the study that was commissioned by CNN, that the messages in American culture are all the same for all people, for all children. White children grow up, just like black children potentially grow up, to be biased against those who are not considered the powerful, meaning those who are not considered white or not part of the mainstream, however way you define mainstream. So it's incumbent upon parents and members that are close to those children, not only in the home, but in the schools, in the churches, in the community centers, to provide more representative, more balanced, more positive, proactive images, particularly of the groups of people that are consistently uh, demonized, if you will, in our culture. And getting back to you know, the institutions, uh, as I said on the panel several years ago, there's a very famous study, I think I alluded to already, uh, the Journal of Personality Social Psychology, that really talks very heavily about key agents in our society, those who have the power to take a life, police officers, those who have the power to determine whether or not a child needs special education, teachers, okay? Uh, those who have the power to determine potential short-term, if not long-term, outcomes if they are biased, which they are, if they are American, and by the way, there's literature now and, and scholars that are talking about the one fundamental thing that makes all Americans the same, it's not liking sports. It's not Thanksgiving, because Native Americans hate Thanksgiving, because that was their Holocaust, by the way. Some scholars are beginning to argue what makes us all American is we all have to be racist to some extent in order to support the system that exists, okay? And so if you accept that premise, I understand people are bristling, you know, and so on, but, you know, truth sometimes hurts. Um, then, the, as Dr. Spencer said, it's incumbent upon all parents, although black and brown parents 
tend to be better at it because they have to if they want to save their kids emotional well-being and they socialize their children to give them positive role models to counter the negative images and stereotypes that they see on TV or now video games or in the schoolyard and so on. Why parents don't have to deal with, again, talked about privilege. It's not what you, what you earn or don't earn, it's what you don't have to go through because most white parents didn't experience discrimination based on their color or their, their status to some extent. They're not as sensitized to the subtleties in which their children pick up when they leave the house or sometimes even within the house. And so it's incumbent upon all, in particular, more so white families and white parents to socialize their children to not, at least to see other people, other groups in a more proactively positive way. And that's the problem. And that's where how racism is continued and maintained and the structure continues to exist as it is because we don't do enough active or proactive uh, countering of these images because we don't think that it applies to us and therefore why should we bother? Well, uh, taking off on what you said about socio and how we socialize, let me ask two questions together, although they're, they're separate. So if you watch the news and you watch conversations um, and crime comes around, what is with black on black crime? As they talk, as as we are, as 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 Fox News and other, e even CNN and every once in a while even MSNBC gets into the same thing, we talk about crime, and we put crime, inner cities, and black on black crime, all in the same sentence. They're all synonymous in our political rhetoric. Um, why is that? But that that. That phrase is a bad phrase, mm -hmm. first of all, because most crime <coughs> is culture on culture. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Most white crime is against a white person. Most black crime is against a black person. Most crime, just in that context, is done against people who are in your social context. And that is the media choosing to cover what happened in North Philly last night and not what happened in Cutstown. White people smoke weed and cuts down as much as white people smoke as black people smoke weed in North Philly. More. Exactly. <laughs> so it's just it's just a matter of what they decided to cover. And so I think we have to really push on the the, the language of that question. Now we could have a conversation about why people do crime in general. Uh, we can, uh, but to use the term black on black. Uh, already twist the conversation because on average everybody that does crime does crime on people who look like them. So uh, keeping with that let me throw one other question. So if that's what you're saying is true, which it is, why don't we talk about why don't white crime? Why is that not in our um, political rhetoric, our political debates? I mean, if you want to talk about black on black crime, the connotation notwithstanding, fine. Like you said, we can talk about crime in general. But why is not white on white crime a phrase in our social political conversations? Dr. John? Well, I think a lot of it, like you correctly said, has to do with media slants, media bias, right? It's not that it's not happening, it's happening. It's what the media choose to cover, right? And so in the effect that we have white on white crime or black on black crime, they choose to sensationalize specific kinds of crime. So typically white on black crime, when you know if you, you go to other neighborhoods, other communities, you do see various ki kinds of crimes happening, but they know what, what will get the most attention. They know what will create the most stir, which is why you know when you have a uh, you know, white police officer killing a, a black person, it's sensationalized, it's, it's horrible, but it's brought to the media forefront way more than if you have a white police officer killing a white um, person, right? And so again, media slant, media bias, um, sensationalizing these issues has a lot to do with it. Sure. Ms. Hainsworth, I wanna bring, bring you in a conversation and, and say something. In reg you, you started your conversation talking about skin tone and the impact on people of color. With that background and what you brought up, I want to ask you about the talk. <laughs> and 
be, be, being a student and a young person on, on, on the panel, one of the reasons I wanted to have you here is because I wanted to ask, from a young person's point of view, one, does the talk happen? Two, should it happen? And are we putting something in your head that in 2019 shouldn't be there? The talk happens every day. I go, I go home and I talk to my parents. Um, it's something that will continue to happen, and it will, I continue to be prepped on the best way to conduct myself. What's the talk? The talk is... For those who don't know and didn't get the talk yet. The talk would be you are a black man in America, and um, due to history and the way uh, the system has always been, you are a target. No matter how you present yourself, no matter how clean cut you may be, at the end of the day, you are still black, and people will fear you for things that you can't change due to the stereotypes that are seen, that they've seen and grew up on. So um, the talk I do still think is necessary due to the fact that there are, are um, scenarios day in and day out where black and brown people are mistreated and not even given the chance to show that they are human. And what was the last point? So had. How does it matter? Uh, how did you get the talk? And when you first got the talk, were you confused? Were you angry? Or you knew it where they were coming from? Uh, uh, tell the story and how, how it happened, how first time you got the talk. I first got the talk when I went to high school. Um, that was just because of just being in a new environment and going to having a little bit more freedom, going to uh, football games and things of that sort and other outings. And for myself, it didn't really. Uh, during this time period of being 14, I, my identity was just uh, starting to be shaped. And um, with that said, it didn't really make sense to me due to the fact that I, I as a kid, I kind of figure, I mean, I'm just a regular student that doesn't really know much, but at the end of the day, I'm, I'm not disrespectful or anything of that sort. So although I didn't, I didn't think that it mattered, it, it quickly became it quickly became something that mattered due to um, during this time period, we've been around 2014, 2015, around that area there, around that area then, um, there were there were um, children in the news such as Trayvon Martin that went through experiences that caused um, outrage for my family as well. So it became important to me due to seeing, uh, knowing my race and, and how I have to conduct myself off of seeing how uh, my brothers are being treated around the world. Um, can, can Dr. I, Robinson, let me I was going to say, can, I, can yeah. I take a crack yeah. at the previous question? I, I, I've been taking notes on this, man. I, I, I was about to bring you in because I wanted to ask you, okay, is it, is it a shame that we had to tell him to talk? Or is it the re it's a reality and live with it? Well, there is an ideological viewpoint and a functional, rational, practical viewpoint. Um, ideology and best case scenarios are part of what privileged people have the opportunity to fantasize about and try to enact because things go pretty much their way so they can think of the best case scenario. For groups of people, and this extends beyond just African Americans, <coughs> but historically oppressed groups, don't have the luxury of thinking ideologically. So it's more practical and functional and therefore necessary to have the talk or the talks, depending upon the social identities involved with the children in mind, um, so that they know in all likelihood, this is what you're going to likely experience at some point or another, either while you're still at home or when you're out on your own. So here's what you need to know and here's what you need to do. When a cop pulls you over, even if they are completely wrong, you shut your damn mouth. You don't do any sudden moves. Even if they violate your rights, you shut up and you take it so that you can live to come home and we can file a complaint the next day. So it's more um, the functional necessity to have the talk, yes, that is more relevant, that is more appropriate than to fantasize about things that don't actually really exist for certain groups of people in, in mass, so to speak. Um, now if I may go back to uh, the black on black, white on white stuff, uh, again, eloquently uh, presented, um, the biggest threat against any general group of people is, well, we can go back, slavery against black folks and Native Americans, although the European diseases killed the Native Americans, so that wasn't capitalistically uh, uh, conducive to, to making money, so then they stole Africans. Um, but today, the biggest threat is white nationalism and that form of domestic terrorism on black and brown people 
including immigrants of color, particularly south of the border. Seems that German, European, Canadian immigrants don't catch the hell that darker hued immigrants get, okay? Um, Jewish folks as well, you know, it's not safe to go to synagogue, unfortunately, these days, okay? Um, so when we talk about the rhetoric of black on black, white on, you know, versus white on white and so on, that's really what's going on. And the reason why, again, psychology angle would say, um, because to talk about white on white then forces the mainstream, the majority, to have to deal with the, 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 the unrealistic, the inaccurate stereotype that only black and brown people are criminals or do criminal-like behaviors. We hear all the time when there's a shooting at a school, oh, that's not gonna happen here, I never thought that that would happen here. Well, damn it, you got kids, you got people who are dysfunctional, yeah, it could happen here. But see, it's that, that issue of privilege, thinking, that, oh, this can't happen to us, because we don't do those things. So to have to entertain the notion of white-on-white -white crime, which, you know, again, I'll defer to the criminal justice uh, folks and sociologists in the room, but uh, that would be more of a threat to other whites than black-on-white or Latino-on-white, all right? Um, but again, statistically speaking, FBI has you know, published from reports, so I've understood that domestic terrorism in the form of white nationalist on black or brown, or in some cases Jewish, uh, victims is much more of a threat than anything else in America, okay? Um, and the, the reason why? Because again, we talk about something called cognitive, di cognitive dissonance. For the m mainstream majority, white majority, to have to talk about regularly white on white crime as, as, as often as it happens or as white kids go to the inner city areas, I will intentionally use the euphemism of inner city, I'll say black and brown areas to be realistic, uh, to get their drugs and so on and then go home and then you know escape being uh, pulled over, prosecuted and so on. Um, they don't wanna talk about that because it creates dissonance. It says, oh man, we, we have just as much of an opportunity to commit criminal behavior, but we don't like to talk about that. Let's focus on the microcosm that's going on down, downtown. Um, and that way it alleviates us of this dissonance. Dissonance is just feeling psychologically uncomfortable because the way you think about something doesn't match up with the reality or with your own behavior. So you think of ways to make yourself feel better about it so you don't have to deal with the reality. And one of the things psychologically that I talk about in some of my classes is white denial. That's another aspect of privilege. Having the power to deny that realities exist, horrific realities exist for people who are not part of the mainstream and act like you know everything is okay and look at things in a very microscopic, my, uh, uh, myopic kind of way. Dr. Wallace? We, one of the other reasons I think we have to recognize is that we have romanticized certain forms of white pathology and we demonize or villainize black pathology, if you will, if I use that language. So uh, I grew up with the Dukes of Hazard. As did I. Bo and Luke Duke. Don't forget Daisy now. Drove the General <laughs> Lee. Mm -hmm. And it was, and Daisy, D Daisy Duke shorts. Mm -hmm. So Daisy Duke shorts are something that we all sort of talk nicely about. But then the rump shaker out of the urban context well is a hoe. Mm -hmm. Keisha was a crackhead, but Becky has an opioid disorder. We as we talk about, you know, and, and so it was Bo and Luke Duke that walked into that South Carolina church and shot up people. They had no reason. He probably showed all the telltale signs, but we've been taught that those telltale signs are not dangerous. And so then there's so much about how we look that is considered pathological or dangerous, so much about what comes out of that context and culture that has been accepted. I mean, I am a black boy who grew up in Shaker Heights, but I had a General Lee car because it was Bo and Luke Duke. Um, now we could take some issues with my dad and all of that other, but I was, uh, and, and we balanced that. My father taught, you know, to help me sort of work through that. But the reality was back in the 70s, Bo and Luke Duke were kind of cool. Um, and we were taught that that was cool. But they ran liquor and they were, ran afoul of the law. Uh, and all Every of Every episode. Every episode. <laughs> um, Every episode. We celebrated that. Um, and, and, and on the other side of that, there was Huggy Bear, mm. Um, mm. which was urban pathology. And so we were taught to view one as dangerous, view one as wrong, and view the other um, as Americana. Um, and that continues to be the challenge, which problematizes the whole conversation, which I, I hope we, we have time to, to deal with, because 
we've come along that we are all right, meaning if you had someone who had a different view, there's some black boy that needs to be told, quit being so lazy. Because we're, we're at a point now, there's, there's somebody that needs to not be so lazy, not be so sensitive. And there's somebody that needs to be reminded that the deck is stacked against us. There, so every answer has its place. Um, because on, on some level, I need to realize that he's against me, he doesn't want me to win, but I can beat him by being excellent then I also need to hear that there are some contexts where my excellence is not going to be enough because of the way the deck is stacked against. And so we're going to all have to be more nuanced in the conversation because it's going to take a little bit of every uh, ideological approach to, to eating this thing if we're going to win. I want, uh, this is, let me just ask one brief question, Doctor. I know that you have two daughters. Did they get to talk? And was it different than if you had sons? Absolutely. They, they got to talk. Um, and I tried to be, as we would say, we tried to be woke. Therefore, uh, they got the same conversation. There is, there is a subtle difference, I think, about what it means to be a black man in this country. I believe that the the arrow is on the back of a black man in a unique way. However, uh, for black people, there was something that I needed to talk to my daughters about how um, they're beautiful. I needed to affirm their beauty. I needed to um, help them understand their worth. Uh, Mary Ellen Stewart in her book, Grace and Gender, says that a father's voice in the life of his daughter is a great emancipator to help them break through the glass ceilings that my gender uh, has created. And so it was really important for me to speak on behalf of, of, of men and releasing my daughters into their greatness. But it was absolutely necessary to have that conversation because I was able to send them to a school um, that was going to remind them of their minority status. And so it was important for me to arm them. Dr. John? Um, I just wanted to do a cross comparison because for those of you guys that don't know, I'm from the Caribbean. I'm from Trinidad and Tobago. So I'm half um, Afro-Caribbean, half Indo-Caribbean. So, you know, moving to the U.S. at a very young age, a lot of what I see and, you know, sociologically studying, you know, the history of the U.S. is so much different from in the Caribbean. We did have slavery in the Caribbean, right? Um, however, when slavery was abolished, the legacy of slavery, um, the way it played out in the U.S., didn't play out in the same way in Trinidad, in the Caribbean, in the English-speaking, Spanish-speaking, French-speaking Caribbean. And so a lot of the issues that African Americans face today in the U.S., there's so much different from what people, Africans, pe uh, people of black descent in the Caribbean face. First of all, Trinidad is predominantly African and Indian, people of African descent and Indian descent. And so while we have issues of colorism, we have issues of class, we don't have issues of giving our children to talk, right? We don't have issues of police brutality. We don't have all of these, so many of these issues that African Americans face in the U.S. And so even when I migrated to the U.S., um, being Afro-Caribbean, Indo-Caribbean, the way I was received as a person of color was a lot different from the way in which African Americans are received in the U.S. And so I don't know if I have that much of an accent anymore <laughs> because I've lived here for a number of years. I do. You do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know. Nothing wrong with it, Bruce. It's just, uh, okay, good. I like my accent. <laughs> <laughs> so initially when someone meets me, they may, meet me, they may think, okay, she's African-American or she may be Hispanic, right? But the minute I start speaking and they detect an accent, right, I literally, and there's sociological literature that says that Caribbean immigrants, African immigrants, are received differently in American society, society mm -hmm. by whites, by the dominant culture. Mm -hmm. And I have experienced that, you know, personally. So I will experience one treatment. The minute I assert my ethnic identity, the minute I begin speaking and linguistically, I sound different from African Americans, that treatment towards me as Caribbean, as an immigrant, is changed. It's different. And so for a person of color living here in the U.S., a lot of the struggles that African-Americans face, you know, it's a lot different and it's a lot complex 
um, put somebody of Caribbean descent. Is it different or better? <laughs> treatment towards me? Yes. It's better. It's better. I receive better treatment. And there's sociological literature that says the minute the dominant culture no longer perceives you as a threat, they no longer see you as, you know, a person who has experienced this history or the same leg legacy, they receive you differently. You know, I, you bring up an excellent point and segue into my next question. All right, then. So let's talk about how blacks are seen. All right, then. Starting with rap music around middle to late 80s, when gangster rap began to uh, supplant the dance rap of the late 1970s, <laughs> early 1980s, and then into the, into the 90s. All right. Now let us have an honest conversation. All those rap videos showing black people with guns, drugs, half-naked women, and rapping that this is authentically black. All right. Taking my Fox News uh, brethren's viewpoint for a moment, there's no way you're blaming us for that. That was your own image. You put that on the wall yourself. Dr. Robinson? Well, you know, somehow, Dr. Garrison, I don't see you getting down to Boogie Down Productions or, you know, Mel and Mel. But anyway, that's a <laughs> personal conversation we'll have another time. Even though you're from what, Brooklyn or the Bronx? Which uh, one? I, I'm from the Bronx. Oh, I Boogie Down. Rap. I remember oh, rap when rap was down. dance I, music. Oh, okay. And it shifted. I, I beg your thousand pardons. All right. Anyhow, uh, my personal context and in, in the way that I have to answer that question is, and this is where now social class comes into play within the black experience. I was raised on Lou Rawls, Aretha Franklin. She said who? I'm kidding. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> a generation gap, guys. There you go. <laughs> it doesn't look like it. Anyway, um, the OJs, etc. Now, I listened to some rap, but it wasn't to that extent. In the D.C. area where I'm from, it was go-go music. That's a whole different, another comp that's a whole panel. Anyway. Um, oh, brother, you know, get rich about talk. <laughs> All right. Um, so, rap music wasn't as much of the issue, at least within my household, per se. It was, you know, listening to and now I sound like my parents, as we all do at every generation, you know, listening to the Michael Jacksons and, and the Rick James, you know, and all that kind of P-Funk and all that. But to get to, to address your question, though, um, rap music, or let me go back, hip-hop is the culture. Rap is the music, all right? And anybody in any context, in any venue within a fabric of any society can select out certain things, as Dr. Wall alluded to, demonize it. And if they have the power to put it up on TV, it takes a life of its own, okay? But there are, as I understand it, aspects of rap music, in fact, much of rap music, early rap music, that um, was about the life that was going on in the streets at that time. All right. Now, how it moved from you know depicting life at least to some extent in the streets to what you referenced, that's where the white mainstream comes into play again, because as it has been you know stated during that time and even still today, and I've been reading you know uh, every now and then, the executives that control the music industry are whom? Are they? Do they look like Dr. John? Uh, negative. Oh, Vicky wasn't white. Who? Was who? Biggie Smalls. Oh, Biggie. No, no, no. He was. Oh, white. Biggie? And he ran his own house. Uh, Biggie didn't control anything. Someone had to give Biggie a contract. Someone, in fact, let me just go back. Diddy and I went to school together. I'm an HBCU grad, Howard University. Those of you who are my students know this already. Uh, but Diddy only went to school for about a half a semester, so let's not get that cr crazy. Um, but the point is that the people that own the music industry and therefore the gateway to music and therefore the gateway to popular, in this case, American culture, are white executives in suits who didn't give a too much of a damn about the representation of music. It was what sells and what makes the money. And if that's what sells, then we want you to dress like that. We want you to act like it. Hell, Tupac, before he died, uh, wanted to be more socially conscious. Uh, there were other rappers who initially had that tag. And it was well known within the music uh, community, black R&B and rap music community, that in order to at least get your break, you had to rap in certain ways, you had to dress in certain ways, you had to use certain language, you had to, you know, portray the stereotypes, have the half if not completely naked women in the videos in order to get a record contract and to begin to make some money. 
the few people that were successful enough could then go in their own direction. But you had to pay the price individually and or collectively. So the image that we see was promulgated, was created by white folks in business suits, mostly men, possibly some women, who saw that as a purely money-making venture and didn't have any stake or personal investment in the images because it, the images didn't reflect their community. Having said that, I don't know if this is still the case today, my panelists can correct me, but certainly for the longest time, the biggest consumers of rap music are whom? White young white teens or young adults, okay? So the industry is actually run at the top by white business suits who don't listen to that stuff, let's be clear, for the most part, with some exceptions. And the folks that consume it the most are the folks that are probably the kids of the folks that are running the music. Yet the images that are portrayed and therefore the folks that get the most negative impact are the folks who are the actors in it, whether they are willing or unwilling. And this is where economics comes in, because if you don't have education, don't have access to other ways, and you try to you gotta make your break, try to get in music or sports, you gotta do what you gotta do per what the business owners say. And unfortunately, the business owners don't represent the interests of the employees. And we can get into the NFL stuff and that, you know, but we won't, at least I won't, uh, unless I'm asked. Uh, but that extends to that as well. So the images that we see are not who, it's not representative of who controls the image and why. So we have to be very, uh, in my classes I say, we have to develop the intellectual critical thinking tools to really analyze, okay, this is what we're seeing, but who's really pulling the strings? Who has the most access to the power, to the means, to the economics to coordinate this, these images? And when we think about it historically, let alone in today's time, it's usually not gonna be the people that you see on camera, with the exception of, um, of um, oh, what's my man's name? Um, just opened his place down in Atlanta. Move him, um, Tyler Perry. Yeah, Tyler Perry, yes. Although, I, I will say, I, I like Tyler Perry, but he had to be a buffoon at first with Medea, although I like, my mom is from New Orleans, my dad's from Shreveport, so I'm a Louisiana by heart. So I know about a Medea, you know, metaphor, but he had to play the Medea uh, stereotype in order to get the money to get white folks to enjoy it so that he can then gain the economic power, but here's the more important thing. I don't dwell on what people did to get in, but what do you do when you have the access and the power? He has created his own entire Hollywood in Atlanta, Georgia, where my sister and brother-in-law live. So I'm gonna be visiting you know, Tyler Perry Studios if they let me on set. Um, and that's the most important thing. Yes, I try to be reluctant to criticize people for getting to doing what they can to get access, because let's be real. Jay-Z slung rocks, so to speak, literally. But now he's rubbing shoulders with the NFL owners. That's another topic for another day, whether or not you know, he truly is still representative of the black community. But the point is, what are you doing now proactively? Tyler Perry is now giving jobs to folks who otherwise would not be able to get a job in Hollywood or the TV industry. Okay, So that's really what we need to focus on. Be aware that the images just are a slice a realistic slice, but a slice, but in no way are usually going to be representative. Just because I see or the movie Dumb and Dumberer, okay, they came out when in the 90s or whatever, all right, about two idiot white boys, all right? But most of us don't assume that that's representative of white men, do we? Because Hollywood and the music industry, for that matter, controls how diverse we see the images that they're presenting. So we see a lot of different images of white males and females in a very representative way. So the one or two images of idiotic white folks, you know, just you know, having fun, no big deal, okay? But with so few opportunities for people of color in Hollywood and TV, we only get a certain sliver, and usually the, the gr movies that are greenlit are the ones that speak to the stereotypes. Again, you have to go behind and ask who's controlling the dollars. Follow the paper trail or the money trail. That'll be your answer as to why the images are the way they are, and they usually don't represent, if it's a negative image, the people um, that are controlling the, uh, the, the industry. Dr. Waller? Yeah, no, I, I think he said it right. Um, and, and when you trace back <coughs> Sony Corporation getting involved in the game, but that's, that's with pretty much all of black life. I abhor the, the, the series Greenleaf. Um, mm. You know, Greenleaf is about the black megachurch and that is so far from reality, uh, but then it lifts up, it lifts up 
who people think we are. When you think preacher, you think pimp, you think millionaire, you think claims, you think taking advantage of the black community. But that's the church piece. And so then they'll put up. And so when I see my world put up on the screen, I have to then raise critique about what could be somebody else's world. Uh, and so I'm, I'm very clear uh, that that whole industry is driven by the consuming white teenager uh, and and we're feeding it. So you did raise a question, and and because I don't want to leave this panel giving white racists and systems all the power, uh, because we still have some choice. With all of that, we still have some choice to not play the game, and not be involved, and to break free. And I know that maybe another time we have that part of the conversation because we're pointing out the problems, but there are. We are crafting out some solutions, and there's a way to, <clears throat> to break free of it and to succeed um, beyond success as driven by dollars and cents, uh, but succeed in terms of having life and that more abundantly and real community and real self-identity and self-assuredness and all of that, uh, which, is a, which is an important part of this conversation. Okay. I know we're coming close to the end, but I want to... Um um, ask uh, Mr. Hainsworth one other question in light of a panel that we're had that we're that's coming up um, next. So we've had so we've had a panel on a conversation about how racism and slavery um, functioned in creating the United States. We've had a panel on the contemporary issues thereof. The next panel talks about well, how should all of this be taught? in high schools, in our college um, classrooms. And just to, give a, just to give this panel a chance to put its uh, thoughts on it, uh, I want to ask you first, you, you, you've been a student at Kutztown. I'm going to take a moment of privilege and, and brag. He's one of my students, and, and he's the kind of quality student that, that we have at, at, at Kutztown. And, and it, was, it was my honor to have him, and you could hear how, how he his thought processes, and, and I'll take a small piece of pride, forgive me, and I might have had a little <coughs> um, small uh, pouring uh, thereof. He was mine, too. But he was, but, don't uh, get twisted. You know, he, but <laughs> my, 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 my question is, how should, how should these be issues be taught in our various classrooms, both on a college level and high school? <coughs> we, have, we have some um, high school um, uh, teachers here. Thank you for coming. What advice, in, our, in the last two, three minutes, what, what advice uh, would we like to provide, sir? I think, <clears throat> I think it's best for the teachers to understand that they play a role in it, and it's, in, it's important through, throughout the education system, starting from, um, I say, first grade or whenever students will be able to understand um, that these issues that minorities face are serious. It's, it's nothing to joke about. And if a teacher isn't giving its proper do this, uh, these sources and information its proper seriousness, then you can't expect um, children to and uh, students to. Um, I say a perfect example of it is just it's just when you have to, when you take something serious, you take a, a deeper look into the light skin versus dark skin debate. And I bring that back up because. At one point, it was a joke. It was something of, oh, he's light skinned, so he's acting this type of way, or they're dark skin, or things of that sort. So, although it may be lighthearted, there's a seriousness in that that needs to be corrected, and it needs to always be corrected as it's happening. It's not one of those things where you kind of just shrug it off because if you do that, then it'll never stop. And um, I just think the the seriousness of of this conversation needing to be taken place is 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 something that is. Uh, it, it's necessary because there is no reason why in, in this day and age where, where when people talk about being black, they associate it with having some type of swag to you or speaking in, in, a, in a dumb manner. And, and being black is, is ugly or dirty. But then when you talk about you talk white, that is they, they associate that with intelligence. That, that alone, what, the, what, what, you, what people, if you have that perception of, of color, then that then that just goes back to how it's a systemic problem that will continue to be a, a systematic issue that will always continue throughout generations. All right, I'm gonna have uh, Dr. Waller um, uh, anchor. So uh, Dr. Robinson, Dr. John. Well, I will go this way. I'll just, believe it or not, succinctly say, 
the issues we talked about today about, are about 50% of what I talk about in my Psych of the Black Experience class. So those Kutztown students in the room who have not taken it, and I see some that have, and those that still might, if you're interested in this stuff and want to know, as Dr. Waller appropriately referenced, the positive side, what we can do to overcome this, take the class, because we get into that as well. Um, teaching it, how teachers should do it, theoretically, and how the rank and file African American and other people of color and other oppressed groups should go about their embitterment and no longer be uh, you know, uh, mentally oppressed and so on. So I'll just leave it at that. Dr. John? Um, I teach race and ethnicity um, in the Department of Anthropology and Sociology. And the last time I taught race, I had one student, he was a graduating senior, come up to me and he thanked me. He said he had, he had gone to high school, all through high school. He's about to graduate from Kutztown University, and he's never had a class like race and ethnicity. And he's never had to talk about these issues. So I think as teachers, as educators, as professors, we always tell students not to, you know, whitewash history. We always tell students to really have a dialogue, open a dialogue about these issues, um, and to, to get into the nitty gritty of, the, of these um, issues, because it's so very important. And you can very well graduate from Kutztown University without taking one of these classes, but I think it's just so very important to have a sociological outlook or psychological outlook on racial and ethnic issues in America today. And before Dr. Wall chimes in, let me just say, uh, and I teach this in my senior seminar class, nowadays college graduates and certainly graduate school graduates, you need to have what's called cultural competence to have a better chance at getting a job these days or to get into a graduate program, which means you need to take some of these formal classes on mm -hmm diversity, inclusion, race, or any particular group, um, because that's what employers are looking for, because guess what? More and more of their consumers and people that they service no longer look like, or are going to less and less look like the white majority mainstream. So it would behoove you for your own intellectual development, but also for your practical uh, job uh, obtaining skills mm -hmm. to take some of these classes and, and really take them seriously and be willing to be a little bit unnerved about what you're learning and realize, oh, I just have a lot more to learn. And you'll come out much better and much happier and more intellectually satisfied on the long run. Dr. Wallace. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to be a part of this conversation. I believe television is sensational. Everything you hear on television is an extreme side that does not represent who the majority of us are. It's either extreme left or extreme right. The truth of the matter is, and I still believe this, even with all that we wrestle with, the majority of us are human beings who appreciate the other human being, who want life to be fair for others and who want to live a good life and want others to have a good life. Uh, but it's hard to be heard from the middle. So as long as we allow the extremes to be the dominant voices, we're going to continue to fight. But for those of us who make up the majority in the middle, um, I think we, we can get at this. Got to learn it. Got to understand it. Um, Got to keep fighting for it. But there are more of us who are good people, white, black, Hispanic, Asian, how, wherever we come from. There are more of us than them, but we all have to fight for it and make it happen. Thank you very much to all the panelists. Thank you all. Thank you.